Well, I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. It's a good time to be here on the 11th hour. It's a very, very good time to be alive. Jesus is alive and he's well, and so we ought to be alive and well. We are going now about to enter into probably one of the greatest moves of God this generation has ever seen or known. And it's going to be a continuation of a move of God that stopped in, a, in the early 70s. And, and now it's the train is coming. I, I keep hearing this over and over. And there's been words about a train. And, and the Lord has given me just over and over about Sunday at Church International. He told me about a train. Uh, on a Sunday, he told me about a train of prosperity that was coming. And then this past Sunday, he said that the funding of the Jesus Revolution has begun. It began last Sunday. I'm telling you, this thing is getting ready to go. Uh, and like revival, you know, I, I, uh, I had posted a word about a train and uh, two events, a train and a revival. Some of you probably, uh, maybe you saw that. And it was about a train and a revival. And I think I gave that back in uh, 20. 2020, 2019, something like that. I, I forget now when it was, but it's on the screen when you go and look it up, the train prophecy, and it was about two events, a train and a revival. And then it said, pray for the train. And it, it mentioned the train again and said, pray, pray. Well, it's not just for the train, but notice right after the incident, and it said a train in the Midwest. That's what pinpointed it. It said, look for an incident or, or a train in the Midwest, something happening with it. It said there'd be two incidences, one with a train, one revival. And it said, pray, pray, because the two are kind of alike. The train that went through the Midwest in Ohio that derailed, and all of that happened. That was on like the 3rd of February, and then the 8th of February, revival at Asbury broke out. And, I, and what the Lord is trying to show us is pray for the event with the natural train, but pray for the event of the revival because it's going to be sought to be derailed. They're going to try to derail it. But when that starts to happen, you need to remember something. This is what the, it's too late. The revival, notice when that revival broke out in Asbury, it began to break out everywhere. It started breaking out on different college campuses all over. And I forget how many now is, is just linked up like train cars. <laughs> Did you notice that? It linked up just like train cars. And just like train cars, the head train is going to try to be derailed so that all the cars come off the track. But it's too late because out of it will come the Jesus revolution. And it will go to the streets. And it's going to go all out in the streets and the, and, the, and the front lawns of people's houses. And it will be in their living rooms. It will be all over the place. They'll start teaching and speaking the Jesus revolution everywhere. Hallelujah. It will happen in the hearts of men in their bedrooms, in their, in their private chambers. It will just suddenly revival will break out, and it will be a revolution of ideas, a revolution about the way God thinks. And it's going to be a move of love, and it will look like love. Hallelujah. But I want everybody to see that, that it's like a, he compared the two, the revival and the train. And sure enough, that revival started linking up right after Asbury. It just started hooking up cars to it everywhere, just like that train. And just like that train, the enemy is going to try to derail it and cause it to jump the track and all the cars to come off and make a disaster from it. But not, not now. This is going to be a Jesus revolution. Should it be derailed? There's going to be a revolution of love start because people are hungry for Jesus. They're hungry for love right now. They're hungry for it all over the world, and they're not going to be able to, to stop that. Only love can quench the thirst and the hunger and feed the hunger of love, and God is love. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Now, I want to, um, I wanted to look at some things uh, today. And um, I wrote this down, and most of it in the dark, so it started there anyway. The Lord talking to me early. And this is what he says to me. See, this Bible that I have in, in my hand right now, this is, of course, this is the authorized King James Bible I, I, I use more than any other. And here it's called the Old and the New Testament. The, the Old Testament, you know, from Genesis to Malachi and the New Testament, you know, from Matthew to Revelation is an old, it's called the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Testament or the New Covenant. And remember at the Last Supper, remember reading where Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. He's, and he talks about this is the New Testament in my blood. This is the New Testament, New Covenant. God is a covenant God. And everything he does, he still, he says this to me, God is still a covenant God. He will fight from that place. He will always fight from the place of covenant. He is tribal, and he will conduct tribal warfare. It's always tribal. It's always covenant. God is not, he's not conventional like you see a lot of people. He's not, he's tribal. This is why Israel is 12 tribes, and, and Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's always covenant. It's always tribe. And it's like I told by covenant brothers in the in the Indian nations and in the and uh, the Native Americans, you call them. Um, God civilized civilization. People say, "Oh, we got to be civilized. We got to be civilized." That usually just means someone who's had the honor beat out of them. But covenant and tribal. That's why the Native people in this nation couldn't get over that men would lie. They didn't lie to each other, and they couldn't get over that men would lie. And so their words became no good to them, and they wouldn't lie to each other. Well, the body of Christ is tribal. We've come into the blood of Jesus. We've, been made, we've made covenant with God through his blood. We entered into Jesus' covenant with his Father, and we're in that. We're his body. And we have to remember he's still a covenant God and he will fight from that place. He is a tribal God and he will conduct tribal type warfare, tribal warfare. Because he fights from these places and from that place of covenant and tribal warfare. Because he fights from there, then he, he does this in a way to protect you and I. He fights from the place of covenant and tribal. So he, he protects us when he does this. Now, I want you to look at Genesis 3, 15. Put that on the screen, and I want you to see some of that today. It is a prophecy that was given, and the Lord himself gave it. And he said, I will put enmity or war between thee and the woman. Now, now notice he said war enmity, war. I will put war between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he's talking to the serpent. And it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now he said, I'm going to do this. But remember, he fights war from the place of covenant and he's, he conducts tribal warfare. So he says, I'm going to put war between you and the woman. Now, he, now we know how he's going to fight it. And he says this, then he starts talking about Jesus being crucified. He said, and between thy seed and her seed and it, her seed shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is talking about the crucifixion. So he's already talking about how he's going to fight this war and how he's going to win this war. He has to do it in covenant. And he's going to do it from that perspective. 
Now, now you just stay with me a few minutes. Now, I want you to look at, at verse 21. And this is after Adam had sinned. Of course, that prophecy was given after Adam had sinned. And watch what happens here now. He says, I'm going to do it through covenant. I'm going to wage a war against the serpent, against his seed. That's the Antichrist to come. And he said, so now we know the war is going to take place from generation to generation between two seeds, two lines coming down the line. Can you see that? So we know it's coming through the seed, two seeds doing battle, trying to gain access into this earth. And so he says this. He comes over here to Adam, and it says, in verse 21, And unto Adam, Adam, the covenant man, and also blood in his face, Adam, red and rosy, also and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them? Now, I want you to take note of that because it says, now this is a covenant. He made coats of skins. There's two kinds of coats talked about here. One is a layered hide. It's a layered hide. And another is leather shirts. So now we realize that there was animals who died in covenant sacrifice to, be, to layer the man's hide. It was a covenant God and Adam made with each other for life to survive. He was going to die. Why? Well, we know his death entered into when he sinned, but he was going to die pretty quickly. Because, remember, when Adam was created, he was robed in glory. He was crowned in glory. He had no, there was no decay, no rot in the earth, no death in the earth at all. So Adam would have had only need for one layer of skin, just one. And he was covered in his outer with the glory of God. And there was nothing to decay him. But as soon as he sinned, he realized Death has entered in, and he would have died because when that one layer of skin died off, Adam could not have lived. So now you know why he would have covered himself with fig leaves. He would have done that. And that fig tree more than likely was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's why he knew his destiny was tied to what he did with that tree. And he took those leaves and began to make him and his wife coats or clothing, aprons, the Hebrew says, talking about trying to cover himself to protect himself. And he hid himself among the trees. You could carry this further, and it also would talk about how Adam made plank houses to hide himself from the elements. He knew things had changed. And so he went to the Lord, and the Lord came and talked to him, and he made him coats of skins. He layered his hide. Now you and I have more than one layer of skin. And one dies off every year or so, ever how often it does, and another replaces it. At least three layers of skin. That why I think it is three layers. Of that, why, that way you have, that's why you can have first, second, third degree burns. And it was because if he hadn't have layered the hide, then mankind would have died away. And because it was leather shirts from animals that was offered in sacrifice, now you know a covenant to live was made between God and Adam. The animals were offered in faith. The hides were used to robe the man, but God made the layers of skin grow. And now he had a covenant to live. Now, this was made with a sinful man. This was made after man sinned. Now, this is very key because it was made with him after he sinned and therefore to his seed that he passed that death on to. So when God makes a decision in this earth, 
The reason it seems like it takes so long for something to happen, you say, when is this justice going to happen? When is this going to happen? Every decision that's made, every harvest that comes up that could potentially kill mankind, God has to fight with this, this covenant right here in his thinking. Everything has to adjust slowly in order to preserve the man's life, not to wipe man off the earth. And so he's doing, he fights from covenant perspective, and he's doing it so you and I can live. If he just came down and said, boom, it's all over, it would be, everybody would be all over. But he does it with this still in his thinking. And so it takes, he moves in the, and fights from tribal perspective. You're his family. You were created in his image and likeness. He still has that in his mind to try to save you from dying. This is why he says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If he'd have wanted every man dead, he would have just not done that right there with Adam. All he had to do was not make that covenant with him, and that man would have died in one year. And so would all of his seed with him. But he went ahead and declared it before he, he announced his intentions to make covenant in Genesis 3.15. When he said, I'm going to put war between your seed serpent and the woman's seed. So now he has to make provision for that seed of the woman to live through the ages to, until it could get to Jesus. Can you see that? Can everybody see that's pretty heavy, isn't it? Huh? Oh, that's heavy, Brother Robin. Yeah, but we have a heavy God. We have heavy, we have big weapons. We have big warfare. And see, right now, you see politicians shaping up all over the world. They are bent on starting World War III. Now, they are just bent on it. They, they have to do it in order to create enough crisis to bring about what they want to do next. But they can't overcome this covenant. They're not going to destroy the world. They don't have the power to destroy. The, oh, yeah, they got a bomb. A bomb? They don't have the power to destroy the world. They may have enough firepower, but they don't have the authority to do it. The Bible said when the word is preached to the ends of the earth, then will the end come. It's this, this word that's going to bring about the end, and nothing else has that kind of authority. And it's all from that one covenant. Well, you know, the world's just full of sinners, and God just going to burn them up like they're nothing. No, he made that covenant to preserve life with a sinner. He did that with a sinner. And if that man would enter into that covenant, then in those days, that blood, those animals, that covenant to live kept that man safe. To get him to the Lamb of God. Now when you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, it's the, it's the body of Christ that is the salt of the earth. Now, not all these politicians. It's the body of Christ. And so when, when God starts breaking out revival and he starts bringing revival, he's bringing something to a, moving it toward a finish. He wants to move us toward that big finish to where we are the victorious church. We are moved into a place where a billion souls he promised he's going to bring into the kingdom. And now it's starting. And the train, everything was a marker in time. I, I, I don't know if that's too heavy or not. I, you know, Brother Robin, you're just getting further and further out. Well, really not. It's just whether you understand covenant. And covenant relationship is where God deals with you and I. He deals with the world through covenant. Even sinners in this time, it was made that they could live until they could make their decision. So every step anybody in the world makes to die, the Lord throws one roadblock after another in their path. You know why? So that one day... Even a sinner 
that's going to go to hell if he dies in his sins or her sin is not going to be able to stand before the white throne judgment and say, you did nothing to save me. The Lord will have every roadblock he threw up to keep them from dying. Everywhere they turned, he tried to stop death from getting to them. Everywhere, while he was telling them about Jesus, telling them about Jesus, they ultimately avoided every roadblock to preserve their life, and then they rejected Jesus in the end. And when you stand before God, you have no excuse. He will show every single thing. He still upholds that covenant just to preserve physical life. But he has to do it with you. Adam could have ripped off those clothes, threw them on the ground, and said, I don't want any part of this. So we have to remember, you think, well, justice moves slow. No, covenant fights from a place of preservation. Covenant fights from a tribal warfare to protect while it conducts its war. So you have to remember this is where God is, is fighting for us. Oh, you know, man, I'm telling you straight up. You see, you know, you see the, the jackal that's sitting where it ought not right now. Why is the jackal not removed? Because of mercy. It was that covenant right there is when mercy first showed its face when he came to Adam and made him coats of skins. Mercy showed up. The reason the jackal is not, uh, why is he not removed? Because of mercy. This is where mercy first was, was clearly seen in the covenant to that sinner. Every decision made has to be considered through the eyes of the covenant of keeping you and I alive and protected. And if some things just ended today, there would be untold millions maybe would die. See, the Scripture talks about in the New Testament that this ship, your tongue is like the, the rudder on a great ship. And though the ship be big, it's talking about your life, the ship. Your tongue is the rudder that moves it. See, it's this way. In the old days when the ships were, the old wooden ships were moving through the, the oceans, they, did, they wasn't made to turn like a speedboat just all of a sudden like that. If it did, it would throw everything on it off into the water and kill everything and destroy the ship. It was made to where you turned a wheel. And they would turn it all the way around and hold it till it stopped. And the little rudder that was relatively, it was big, but it was little to that ship. It would turn, and they would hold it there, but it looked like nothing changed. The ship would just move, keep moving. But if they would hold it and not let it go, after a while it would slowly start turning. And the reason being is because everything on the ship could adjust as the turn was made. If not, it would just kill everything on it. So in your life, when you start confessing the word, talking the word, talking the word, talking the word, then the ship is slowly turning if you won't, if you won't stop. If you keep your confession of faith of God's word going, it will slowly start turning your whole life around. But your life is connected to so many things, they have to adjust in order that it don't damage everything. And it will just start turning. If you won't stop, it'll turn your ship all the way around. Well, it's the same thing in the political world. Prophets come on the scene and start talking, start talking, start saying what God says. God says this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And people say, why don't you prophets shut up? We made some of them sign petitions to shut up. Some of them just backed off and shut up. How come some of you won't just shut up? Because if we 
keep holding to it. This thing is slowly starting to turn. And but one of these first days, as my father-in-law used to say, it will turn all the way around and you'll see it going the other direction. And right now, I can't stop talking. If the nation's going to turn, if the world's going to be preserved, the prophets have to hold their tongue fast into the word of what God has said to say. You're going to have to keep talking, keep saying it, give the people words to say with their mouth, keep talking it, keep talking it. Do you know the world believes in what you say more than you believe in what you say? I remember there was a guy who worked with me in ministry one time, and where he worked at in his secular job, he would talk about the end of time and the rapture of the church and so forth. And a lost man came up to him and said, I wish you Christians would stop talking about that. They said, now this is what they told him. If you talk about it long enough, you're going to talk it up and it's going to happen. They believe it's going to happen. And they know the power of words. Why do you think these secular news channels are fed the same news feed to say the same thing all the time, all the time, all the time? It wasn't long ago, a couple years ago, somebody noticed that and put it out and, and played them all simultaneously and everybody was saying the same things. It's because they know if they keep talking it, talking it, talking it, talking it, it'll start turning the whole thing that direction. And somebody like Donald Trump came on the scene during in the political realm, and, and people like Bibi Netanyahu came in, and all of a sudden, man, it was upending the, the narrative. It was speaking differently. They said, we got to get rid of them. Oh, God, we got to get them out. Got to get them out. We've got to keep everybody talking the same way. Notice this in the book of Revelation. When the when you see the Antichrist actually come and sit where he shouldn't be sitting, and you see him there in the Mideast, you see him there in Jerusalem, you see him there doing these things, and it says that he is, he is trying to take over the entire world, but there's two prophets that are there, and they're resisting him. And it said he can't overcome this fire that comes out of their mouth. It's their words. They won't quit talking the prophecies. They won't stop. They won't quit. And it said whoever tries to stop them, fire comes out of their mouth and consumes them. It's because that's what prophets are talking for right now. And the first thing religion does is it shut them down, shut them down, shut that prophet up, make that prophet be quiet. It, it's only going to happen the way we want it to happen. If we listen to your ignorant mouth, the next thing that would happen is, is that we would lose this great nation and we would lose half the free world. You really need to understand prophetic covenant tribal warfare what do you think prophets were sent here for what do you think they're spotlighted right now you've got fools like like uh, noah harari you've got people like that and klaus Schwab talking about putting chips in your baby's brains and they're doing it out in the open and they're talking about the things will change making cyborgs out of people transhumanism talking about all these things to make you less than human, to rewrite a third strand of DNA into people's body so that you're not human anymore. Think of it. It's not a conspiracy. It's not a crazy prophet talking. I'm not. They're saying that. They're saying that out in the open. And notice they're attacking God when they say it. They're saying things like, well, all the God of the Bible managed to create. Well, why even bring up the God of the Bible if there's not a spirit pushing them? Why wouldn't they just not even mention the God of the Bible? But notice every time, the God of the Hebrew Bible, the God of the Hebrew Bible, all he managed to create, notice they didn't deny his existence. It's because you're looking at a demon-possessed person talking 
from a spirit is speaking that knew God and was there when he created. All he managed to create was organic life. And all you managed to create science is a remote control RC car. That's all you managed to create that has to run on double A's. But no, all he managed to create was organic life, giraffes, tomatoes, humans. Well, let's just, why don't you just do the giraffe first? Do you realize what kind of ignorance? And this is what they're saying, and we're not talking about just some little peon somewhere. We're talking about people who controls vast wealth. And so they're herding everybody like cattle into places where they can't get their hands on any wealth. But I got news for you. A wealth transfer is coming, and it has already begun. And it's going to be like a train coming through. It's going to be the 90 donkeys loaded. It's going to be the wealth transfer, and it will hook up cars of wealth in the body of Christ until it takes 12 months to watch that train pass. And then you take the money away from them and see how many chips they stick in somebody's brain. Take their money away from them and let's see if they talk about a silicone body that don't need anything else. Just take the money away from them and they can't even make a BB. So this is why prophets can't stop talking. I'm just one prophet standing in front of a camera. There's thousands. And they're all speaking into the atmosphere. There's a warfare going on that nobody even sees. And religion can't see it. Religion just walks like, just blind. Just walk around with religious glasses on. Just look around at a pie in the sky. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about people who can't see. I'm talking about religion who can't see. They just walk around staring. And if the power of God breaks out, nope, nope, that ain't us. Nope, that ain't us. No, it ain't you. You wouldn't know the power of God if it bit you on your rear end. All you know is is your fossilized denominational thoughts. You see where that got you, homosexuals standing in the pulpit, singing in the choir, uh, transgenders coming into your church, twerking in front of your six-year-olds, taking little children and against their will mutilate their bodies in operating rooms. That's religious blindness. Who is that? It's what Jesus said. There is none so blind as those who will not see. Those who refuse to see. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The Lord's going to start opening the eyes of the physical blind. And people that have been blind in this earth are going to start seeing again. I'm not talking about spiritual either. I'm talking about physical miracles. They're going to start seeing again. And it's going to be a sign to you that the next step out of that is going to be religion blindness pulled off of their eyes. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody gets, well, we're mad at you, Brother Robin. We're just mad at you. Well, there's a big crowd that is, so just join them up. So prophets can't stop talking. They can't. This Jesus revolution that's coming is going to be with power. It had to start with people being born again. It had to start in revival. A revolution of Jesus' love has to be born in fire, not fog machines, fire, and real fire. I watched that Asbury thing that broke out. Did you know that when you look at it on camera, there was a smoke, a fog hanging all over the place? The glory was there. I don't know who noticed that. But it was there. Anyway, it's coming with power. 
It's coming and you're going to see physical eyes healed, physical ears opened, cripples walking, people walking, doing, power coming. And when religion questions them, the real blind ones, religion, those that were healed will say, well, whether that's of God or not, whatever you say, I'm not sure I know, but I know this. I was blind, and now I can see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so this is what's coming. This is what's coming. So you're going to see miracles you've never seen before. You're going to see souls born again that you've never, never seen before. It's going to be things that you never dreamed would happen. You're going to see people that were in other nations of, of like Islamic nations and, and other things like that. They're going to begin to get saved. They're going to begin to get born again. You're going to see things. There'll come a time when arms will grow out again. You're going to see things like that. It's going to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I have to encourage myself in the Lord. But it's going to come. And when you see it start, know this train is hooking up. Because it's going to pull out of that depot. It's going to pull out and go among the people. And if, if, if the churches won't have it, it's going to pull out from the steeple. And it's going to head out into the world. And there's going to be a Jesus revolution. And it's going to be a radical turn. A radical turn. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Brother Robin, you know, you, you make fun of religion. Well, if it didn't act like such clowns, I wouldn't. You have to remember that it's always religion that comes against the prophet. Well, you know, the prophet said this, did they? Do you know what the prophet said? Do you even know? Do you have the nerve to print what they said? Not what you think they said, what they said. Do you have the nerve? If the prophets shut up, there is no fire. There is to resist what the enemy is trying to do to stop it. I'm encouraging prophets today. Don't stop. Don't stop talking. Keep talking. Keep talking. Keep speaking. You prophets that people may not even know all across the world who you are. But God knows who you are. Keep talking. Keep talking. You're filling the air with words of power. You're filling the air with words of power. It, it's, it would be an asinine thing to think I'm the only prophet or these others you see are the only prophets. Uh, remember what the Lord told Elijah? He said, I got 7,000 just like you. And you're out there. There's a lot more than 7,000s of us. So start talking. Keep standing up talking. Stand up if you can't go anywhere else but your living room. Stand up and start declaring it, the Jesus revolution. We're not giving this world over to the devil. We will occupy until he comes. We will occupy until he comes. So now you know why the prophets are attacked trying to be shut up. Because the tongue turns that ship. It turns that thing. It turns it. And they know it. It's the church that lost sight of this. But the world knows it. The world knows it. Governments know it. You notice the first thing they want to they uh, do away with? Religion. They want to come. They call it religion. The, what they mean is they want to come after the churches. They want the churches shut down. They want their own version of it. That's why they had that Sinai gathering back in October, November, where they wrote the Ten New Green Commandments. They put that out there, where they, a man came down off of Sinai and broke them at the bottom of it, where we're supposed to repent for the damage we've done to the earth. Really? Really? Supposed to repent. You know, I ain't seen one bird complain. 
I look out there, I see squirrels and birds and all kinds of animals and deer proliferating. I mean, just like you just multiplying them like that. And you know what? If we've done so much damage to it, how come they're not dead? The only time they die is when a man releases something into the air, governments. This is crazy. They're trying, on that day, they tried to start a new one world religion. So we have to talk. So don't, don't, don't come and try to silence prophets. If they shut their mouths, I'm telling you, this world's in trouble. I mean, they're in trouble. It's prophets that resist the Antichrist all the way to the end, all the way. So keep speaking. Keep talking. And, you know, when, if you're going to criticize something that's spoken, you know, study first. Look at it from a spiritual. Look at things. Look at the Word. Look at it. In it you have life. Amen. He is our life and the length of our days. Amen. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. I think it has. I don't see many people smiling around the fortress, but I think it has. I think it's been a good 11th hour today. Well, you know, Brother Robin, you just, you just do this. The only thing I criticized was organized religion. That make you mad? Well, you know, you got the same britches. You can get glad in them. Just stop and, and go before the Lord and say, Lord, show me your power. You know, there's a couple of, uh, I've heard different stories of Islamic people that, you know, they've been taught all their life that Jesus wasn't the, the Messiah. He's not the way. And so they finally just prayed, Lord, if you're, if you're him, show me. And they just, he appeared to them, just appeared to them. Boy, that radically changed their theology. You know, I think it's been so long since religion saw Jesus, I don't even know if they'd know him. I don't know that they'd know him at all. You know, back in 1968, it had been so long since uh, there's only pockets of people who knew who Jesus was. People like Oral Roberts, people coming up in that time, and people like A.A. Allen, William Brannan, Catherine Kuhl, they knew Jesus. They knew the real one. But you know, organized religion at that point had just got to where it didn't know him anymore. And when all of a sudden he showed up in the Jesus revolution and the Jesus movement, they called it, the Jesus freaks, I'm convinced it, it, was prof it was either being prophesied or trying to come to pass when DC Talk wrote that song, Jesus Freaks. I'm convinced they were either prophesying it or it was trying to come to pass then. I really do. Because it was radical. You know, I wish I knew the words to it. I'd read them to you. It would absolutely upend your theology. I saw a man with a tag on his big fat belly as it moving around like marmalade jelly. Something like that. He said, it took me a while to read what it said because I had to match the rhythm of his belly with my head. Jesus saves is what it read. It reads... What he raved in a typical tattoo green. Stood on a box in the middle of the city and he said, I have a dream. Now that's, that's Jesus freaks. That's Jesus freaks. And that's what we are. We're just, we're Jesus freaks, they call us. Okay. All right. Welcome to the freak show. I mean, I'm here. I'm, I'm standing here, yeah, you know, you don't look like we think you should look. You don't, you don't, uh, you know, that's right, because I'm part of that crew. I'm part of that crew. And so we, I'm, I'm convinced they didn't know what he looked like. Then all of a sudden he starts moving in California. 
And he starts moving on all of this. And he starts bringing it to pass. And he starts saving the hippies. And he starts saving those on drugs and saving those out of the homosexual communities. He starts saving those. When, and all of these, these witches and warlocks and all these kind of people come into the Lord. And they, would even, they got so into Jesus, they wore their hair like him, beards like him, sandals like him. Some of them wore robes like him. And you see all of this happening. And music I remember even the Doobie Brothers came out. In what, 72, was it? They came out with Jesus is just all right with me. Man, that was one massive, powerful song. And then, well, who was it did? Spirit in the Sky. I'm going to go up to the Spirit in the Sky. That was part of the Jesus songs. They did that on purpose. I mean, think about it. A group called Doobie Brothers singing about Jesus and who he is. Just think about that. And you had songs like that. And you had, you had something happening. And then religion saw it. Oh, oh, look at them. Oh, look at them. And all they were doing was crying out for the Lord. And then that's when somebody like, you know, Chuck Smith began to connect with them. And so it's about to happen again. And when it does, religion's either going to have to change or move. Because this is the, that kind of religion has no place in this. It just don't have any place in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, you know, what was it in, they said before, somebody said, I remember this, that don't criticize somebody's dirty feet until you're prepared to wash them. So we have to remember stuff like that. What else do you have anything for? You're blessed so you can bless them. You're blessed so you can spread the gospel. You're blessed so that you can show them another way of living. You can, not a religious way of living. Don't come in and tell somebody cut their hair off above their ears. Not when you've got a picture of Jesus hanging up in your house with hair past his shoulders. Don't do that. Don't tell somebody to shave their face when you've got a picture of Jesus with a forked beard about four inches below his chin or so, six inches. You can't, don't do that. I remember one time I was driving a church bus. And I was, I was doing anything to reach people for the Lord. I was, I was just I was driving a bus, uh, going out, picking up little children. Uh, our ministry, we, we didn't fit in anywhere, you know. And so we just had a youth center we were working with and just trying to reach people, teenagers, young adults, old adults, it didn't matter. And we'd go in and get people who didn't have no, no money, no food, and we'd feed them, and we didn't have no money either. But we'd somehow, we'd take what we had, and the Lord would multiply it. And I began to look for a bus. I wanted a church bus, you know, back in those days, the old school buses. And this one church had this little half bus, school bus. And I went to test drive it, and me and a couple other men. And, and the pastor of that church was in the bus with me, sitting behind me while I'm test driving it. And, and we got to talking about ministry coming down the road, and I was coming up to a tra uh, stop sign, not a traffic light, a stop sign. And I, I said, I told him a bunch of things, and he was older than me, so I respected him. And I said, well, how am I doing? He said, well, you're doing okay, except, and he reached up and flipped my hair off my collar like that. And my hair wasn't nearly this long. It was just touching my collar. He flipped it off my collar. He said, all except for that. Well, I had whiskers too. And he said, don't tell me. And then he just said this. He said, don't tell me and don't try to tell me that Jesus had a beard either. And I said, really? I said, well, Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6 said they plucked it out by the root. Oh, he got real quiet. He got real quiet. He had to have had some kind of whiskers because they plucked it out by the roots. 
Now, he was hung up on my hair. It didn't make any difference how many hundreds or maybe thousands of people we were seeing born again. He didn't like my hair. He wanted Jesus to look like him instead of him looking like him. Now, I'm not downing him. He was, on, he was just caught up in that. You know, <clears throat> a cultural captive is not even qualified to judge their own surroundings because people can be living all around you in some, some other lifestyles, and they think it's normal. But if you're a cultural captive, you're not even qualified. If you think everybody has to look like you, talk like you, dress like you, be like you, and revival can only come the way you say it can come, then you're not even qualified to judge the, your, your own surroundings. A prophet said that. And so I wrote it down. It's that powerful. Hallelujah. So today, I want you to get ready for that love train that's coming. Because it's coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And let's take our religious blinders off so that we're just not walking around just straining at gnats and swallowing camels. You know, that could be taken a lot of ways. Strain out a gnat. And swallow a camel. Well, people say, well, you know, that's, that had to do with their straining water and, and straining things and dirt and all of that. Uh, in the South, it don't, you know. <laughs> you figure it out. Hallelujah. Well, Krista, you want to come and tell us how to prosper? Because the Lord wants us prospering. You know, Sunday at Church International, he said, I have begun the funding of the Jesus Revolution. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. That, that should be everybody's offering message for the next, like, three weeks is just go back and watch that service. <laughs> just go back and watch that service and just soak in that teaching on the fact that God, not only does he want you to prosper, but he tells you how. He tells you how to prosper. And so one of the things that stuck with me Sunday that I will never, ever forget, and it just makes you want to prosper, it's the fact that God's vengeance on the enemy is your prosperity. Awesome. That, that was just, it leaped in me. I mean, your prosperity, you prospering, you just prospering and living in health and just enjoying life is God's vengeance on, on the enemy. You know, the scripture says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Like he, he wants that vengeance on the enemy by making the enemy sit back and watch you prosper. Just watch you prosper because the first thing that the enemy <laughs> came to take was rip prosperity from mankind, period. Spiritually, physically, and financially. Just boom, rip it away from you. That's why, that's why they, they left the garden, the most beautiful place. He, that was his plan. He, want, he wanted all of that. That was supposed to be his and his twisted thinking. That was his. So he came immediately to start ripping it. Because when your prosperity is taken away from you, spiritually, physically, and financially, well, then you have really nothing left. You have nothing left. And he knew once sin came into this world that our bodies were going to start dying physically, immediately. They just start... They just started decaying. They, they would start uh, failing and, and, and leaving. And that's his main goal is to get you out of here. It's just to get you out of the way. But without prosperity, you can't, you can't get the right nutrition for yourself. You can't get the right care. You can't get the best treatment for you to continue your life. And so he knows this. So he immediately comes to strip it from you. So when we learn to prosper God's way and we learn, the, we learn number one, that God wants us to prosper. 
But then we start learning how he wants us to prosper, how to do it. Well, then that's just God holding the devil by the neck and saying, watch them. Watch them prosper. That's his vengeance on him. What the, the people that you tried to make poor, the people you tried to make sick, the people you tried to kill, watch them prosper and live in health and enjoy life. The Lord likes to do that. He likes to rub the devil's nose in that. Why? Because he wishes above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And so once we raise our soul level, number one, how we do that is knowing that God wants us to prosper. Because faith begins where the will of God is known. Then your soul starts climbing. Then you start receiving knowledge and revelation from the scripture. <clears throat> and when that starts filling you up, your soul starts growing. And your soul starts, starts coming up. Well, then it says even as everything else comes up too. You know, I said this a long time ago. I said, are you not prospering? Are you not in health? Check your soul. Check your soul. Where's your soul level at? Where is that at? Because it's supposed to be an even number across the board. So are, are you sick? Check your soul. Check your soul. Find out where, where that is because, you know, depression brings sickness. It'll just bring it on. Are, are you broke? And you don't know how to how to pay anything, and you don't know how how you're going to do this or how you're going to do that. Check your soul, because it's an even thing that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And how is our number one way of prospering? Get in this right here. Raise your soul. Raise your soul, so that you can start prospering and living in health like God designed for you to do from the very beginning and let's get vengeance on the enemy you know what hasn't he taken enough from you hasn't this gone on long enough it's gone on long enough let's stop it let's stop it in our life because our best days are ahead of us they're not behind us and all I've got stuck in my head is people all over the world Join hands. Start a love train. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I've got, got in my head right now. We, we've got, you know, it takes, it takes funds. It takes prospering to keep this train moving. You know? Yeah, you're singing it. I know you are. You're singing it now. Love train. <laughs> well, while we're joyful, Luke 6, 38, it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, <clears throat> shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it. I receive it. I call it done in Jesus' name. Now for the tithe, Malachi 3.10 says, Bringing all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. So be it. People all over the world, join in. Join the love train. The love train. I'm going to tell you, it is coming. The Lord started talking to me about that this morning, the love train. Well, you've got to have a ticket, but the ticket was already bought for you. It's already paid for. What you have to do is just receive it. Just receive it. The Lord's holding that ticket out to you right now. And what is that? Well, 
You know, there's no way you could pay for your sin. There's no way that you could ever bear and pay for Adam's treason, the way what Adam did and passed on to you. And that death he passed on to every man had to be paid for. Well, Jesus did that on the cross. That's why he went to the cross. He did that there. He became the sacrifice. Uh, <clears throat> this thing had to be paid. And so when it grew dark that day and hell came to, to more or less annex the earth into itself, it just came to, to cause the annexation of the earth. Hell had enlarged itself to receive God's people. When he came that day, Jesus was the one who bore the sickness, carried the pain, the sin. He became our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 declares it. It declares that. Look at this. Put that on the screen. Let the people see this. I want you to see that. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. It says, For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? He that knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, that's what he did. He traded places with us on the cross. And so when you receive him as Lord and Savior, you know, you make him the Lord of your life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Look what that says. It, says, it declares these things. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, a few things have become new. No, all things have become new. And it goes on to say, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to be going and telling people, look, God is not mad at you. He's not holding anything against you. All you have to do is make Jesus the Lord of your life, and you're back with God as if you never committed a sin. Not because of your righteousness, because of his righteousness, and he took your unrighteousness, and now when you make him Lord, you become the righteousness of God in him. And that's the message you're supposed to go tell the world. The next verse went on to say it, to go tell the world about this thing. It says, to wit that God was in Christ, to know, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's what we're supposed to be preaching. That's what we're supposed to be preaching. That's what's piloting this love train. That's what's bringing it about. That's who's at the helm of it. Can you imagine, man, and when that train pulls up in front of the world and suddenly you see people getting on it with hair longer than mine and people with nose rings, ear gauges, all kinds of tattoos on their faces and they start to step up on that train and religion says, you can't get on this train. I mean, how in the world is God going to let you on this train? And you get up there and they say, I don't know, ask the, ask the conductor. He's the one that invited me on. And they look up there at him and Jesus turns around and swings his hair around and looks at all of them with his forked beard and maybe flashes that thigh of his up there and it's got king of kings and lord of lords tattooed down the side of it and holds out his scarred hands with those holes and daylight shining through it and you know what religion would say religion would say oh he, they wouldn't even say he's got a some would say look at that tattoo on his thigh the other one would say look at him showing his thigh they can't even get over it. And then he's going to ride a horse and show his thigh. Boy, that just upends everything. But when you look up at his eyes, it blazes with chesed, the fire of God. It's coming out of his eyes. And that's the, that's, that's the chesed, the chasid in the Old Testament, the tender loving kindness and tender mercies of God. And what it means is, is it's someone who has, it's like a mother and a love for her baby that would throw herself into a burning building with no thought for her own safety because she loves that child so much that's who's driving that train that's who's driving that train 
And he will tell the homosexuals, come on up here on my train and receive me as Lord. And they'll start getting born again. Drug addicts pulling needles out of their arms and out of their neck and out from under their tongue and throwing them down on the ground. And they'll start getting born again. And they won't have ungodly desires of homosexuality or drug addiction or alcoholism or, or anything like that. Suddenly their whole lives change and there's a big train rolling through the earth with Jesus driving it, conducting the train, going through there, singing. People all over the world, come on, join in, join the love train, love train. And everybody back through there, all the hippies and yippies and cowboys and tattoos and, and earrings and gauges, they'll all go whoop, whoop, and they'll get going down through the earth, whoop, whoop. And then maybe Coca-Cola can sing its song again. It is got to teach the world is sing. And maybe that can start singing that. Some of you my age remember that commercial. In perfect harmony, perfect harmony. You can only teach the world to sing in perfect harmony when Jesus is the, instead of the Coca-Cola they're holding up. Hallelujah. And then people start reacting. And wicked politicians will look like this. You can see them. We lost our power. We lost our power. Yeah, you did. So go sit down somewhere. Get out of the way. And let somebody come up that will hold the Bible up like we just had a president do and say, this is what we're going to live by. This is what we're going to live by. And stand up there and talk about this. And remember with this one president, I'm, I'm convinced he's the president for the Re Jesus revolution. I'm convinced of it. Listen at the way he talked. We're going to go by this. Then he said, somebody said, you're the most popular man in the world. He said, nope, there's one. No, I'm not. They said, who is? He said, Jesus Christ. He said, it's not even close. It's not even close. And then somebody turn, come up to him and say, you, you know, you believe in the Bible? Hell yeah. And religion says, oh, he can't talk that way. He can't talk that way. They're cultural captives that are trapped in their own culture. You know what cult means? The word cult. Hey, you're a cult. You know what cult really means? Someone who worships their own belief. Someone who worships their own belief. That's the definition of cultist, cult, culture. Someone who worships their own belief. They become cultural captives to their own belief. Hell, you know, uh, Donald Trump can't be president because he talks so rude. Well, when did that disqualify anybody from being president? You know, they came, uh, they came to John the Baptist down and, and asked, he told them, brood of vipers. You, Jesus said they were a nest of vipers. He talked about their mothers were snakes. And you're going to have a Jesus revolution come along. I'm going to tell you something. I'd rather have, I'd rather have, way rather have somebody like Trump come up and say, we're going to, we're going to go by this. I don't care if he throws a word here and there around. That's between him and God. But he holds that Bible up instead of the jackal that's standing there. And this is all they say. They even took God out of their own convention. Just removed him. And stand up there and blaspheme from daylight till dark. No, no, no. That's not who's driving this train. The one driving this train, man, is, has got that tattoo, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's got them many crowns sitting on there. Hey, look at that gaudy crown he's wearing. Shouldn't them crowns have been sold and given to the poor? Well, it's not going to be, Hossfly. He's not selling his crowns and, and paying and, do, and distributing the money. We're not going to spread that wealth around. He is the king. King of kings, Lord of lords. He's got a big old brandished tattoo on his thigh. And he, he, he exposes that thigh while he's riding his white horse. And he don't care what you think about it either. And there's an army like him right behind him. 
And one day I'm going to get to ride in that army. I'm going to get to ride right behind him. And I'll have on my black coat. And I'll come riding right up behind him. It's like Dwight Thompson said that time, I'll ride up so close, so close that Jesus finally turns around and says, Dwight, get on your own horse because I want to ride on his with him. But we're going to ride like him, and you're going to look over next to you, and you're going to high-five somebody who's got, who's got earrings and nose rings, and you're going to look at them, and they're going to look at you with a pink hair going right down the middle of their head and go, woo, yeah, whoop, whoop, and we're going to ta start talking about this train coming. With his eyes blazing fire. Now, we might as well just get ready now. Now, I mean it, you know. By God, we're going to have to get ready for a move of God now. It's just the only way it's going to happen. The only way you're going to partake of it is get, get ready for it. Yeah, I don't know, brother. I don't know, brother. You know, I, I, I just, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just still want to criticize. i tell you what you do. You go in your kitchen. Or your back room, close the door, sit down in your chair, and criticize all you want till you go to sleep. When you wake up the next morning, start criticizing again. Just stay in that room. And then when you come out and the, you start criticizing the revival and somebody say, where you been, Hoss? Man, we've done seen 40 million saved. Hallelujah. So how do you get this ticket? Well, Paul said this, if you believe in your heart God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he is your Lord, you shall be saved. He didn't say you might be. He said you shall be. So right now, why don't you just do that? Why don't you say, Lord Jesus, come on, say it with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior. Live big in me. Live in my heart. Cleanse me of all sin. From this day forward, I am born again. Jesus is my Lord. Then don't stop there. Then just stop and think a minute. Wait a minute, I've heard them other tongues. I've heard somebody speaking them tongues. I want that. Then just say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of praying and speaking in other tongues. I thank you for it. And now I'm going to speak in tongues. arupa and that dynamo in you starts to turn now. And it starts to turn in that fire. You are baptized in fire now. And now it's starting to kindle. And that same fire will come up in your eyes and in your mouth. And the eye coming out of your eyes is you see things the way he sees them. You see them in love and you speak with power and authority of the word. Hallelujah. And if you've done those things, then I want you to to. Write us, email us, let us know what, what, what's happened to you. Go to the website, robindbullock.com, and you can just download a, a little booklet called Jesus, Why It Is the Way It Is. And if you can't do that, if you could send us a physical address somehow, we will send it to you postpaid and free. Hallelujah. I don't care where you are. If you can send me an address, we will send it to you paid for. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's been good to be here on the, the 11th hour today. We're a place where we hear God speak, where we can make 11th hour decisions. There's a train coming. Love train. Get ready. Hallelujah. All right. So, until next time, I want you to remember, if you're bound up in religion, say, Lord God. Wash this religious mess off of me so I can be ready for the train. I can be ready for the movement. Go ahead and do that. He'll do it. Amen. Until next time we gather together, right here 
around God's Word. I want you to remember, never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom. Thank you.